Welcome to the Critical Media Studies Podcast. We're your hosts, Mike Rapici and Barry Falk. Hello, Dr. Rapici. Hello, Dr. Falk. How are you this evening on this evening podcast, this um, evening version of the Critical Media Studies Podcast? I'm doing well. I get excited for these because I feel like I have an extra handful of hours to think about <laughs> all the things that I want to say. <laughs> And uh, so I'm excited. How are you? How are you? I'm do I'm doing well, and we're both excited then uh, to talk about Dina Latovsky's um, recent blog piece. The problem of AI photography is not the medium; it's the message. Uh, one of the reasons we're talking about Latovsky is that this is coming after a couple of episodes where we've been talking about versions of the hyperreal. First, Susan Sontag. Um, also, Andre Bazan, their explorations, the explorations in their work of um, uh, photography and their arguments about photography creating a new kind of simulated world. And then we just our most recent podcast, we discussed uh, Baudrillard, uh, classic texts on simulacra, where he argues that the function of the real in contemporary media uh, in contemporary meaning systems or cultural systems, the function of the real is only that. It's only a function and that the, any meaningful distinction between the real and the unreal, the authentic and the fake, um, increasingly it becomes just, fun, you know, uh, the meaning of the real um, is only tied or can only be ascertained through its functionality. So we don't have a meaningful distinction that we can impose or articulate between the real and the unreal um, and that's and that's because the the unreal the copies the artificially generated yes. uh, versions of these still perform uh absolutely the same function so absolutely yeah just, just um so yeah and then that, that that lends us with the hyper real and that thing and thank you for that clarification that's a very helpful clarification uh so anyway because of this prior discussions we were sort of um interested in Latovsky's argument um, article, and not only for her reference, her breathless reference to our hero, uh, Marshall McLuhan, but also because she is specifically concerned with AI photography. And this is a, a last sort of prefatory remark. One of the reasons, the other reasons, and uh, another reason why we were interested in Latovsky's piece is that the structure of her essay, the structure of her her reflections on AI photography, um, I guess we should include a link maybe, uh, by the way, we should include a link maybe when we post this so readers can, can find the article. But one of the reasons we were interested in Latovsky's article is that the structure of her argument is an interest, it makes an interesting parallel, make, uh, interestingly fits up fits very well with the structure of Zan's article on the ontological status of the photograph. Um, in that uh, Bazan rehearses and sort of gives this long take, his uh, a long commentary on the meaning of painting uh, in term and the function of painting in, uh, in really in kind of in Western culture and the functional meaning of painting and his argument that to understand what photography is, you have to understand the ways in which photography is, an emo is a moment that eclipses, that sort of culminates a prior history of painting and at the same time replaces that history with a new technological development. So there seems to be a kind of clear parallel between the structure of Bazan's argument and the structure of Latovsky's argument, which opens with a case uh, with a discussion of AI photography and sort of moves into this larger meditation on the meaning of art and creativity. Is that fair? Absolutely. Is it, um, that a fair, Pracy? And I should also mention, and then I want to kick it to you here, uh, should also mention that her case study is a furor over a particular example of AI art that won a trophy, that won a, I think it won an award, right? It won a major well, sort of art world award. Um, 
Is that right? I, I think he, it's not that he won an award. So I'll read the first paragraph of mm-hmm. the article, which will, I think gives enough context. Okay. So she says, the current AI scandal of the photography world centers around photojournalist Michael Christopher Brown. Mm-hmm. He has been lambasted on Instagram for generating AI, generating AI images of Cuban refugees in a project titled 90 Miles and selling them as NFT artwork. Several well-known artists were among the hundreds who came to express their outrage. One guttural scream of a comment from National Geographic photographer encapsulated the conversation. Quote, this is shameful to our industry and to Michael. Shit. He was canceled. He was canceled. So he yes. was, and ultimately yes. he was canceled, right? So yes. the article really is two of two pieces. For the first half of the piece, Latovsky is basically talking about why photographers in particular are so up in arms with AI and what Brown did. Mm -hmm. And then she flips in the second half to a sort of, I I guess we can call it a defense of what he did. It's, it's, it's tepid at best, I think, but uh, you know, uh, an explanation perhaps. And then from there she pivots back uh, and and cites Nick cave who has um, unkind things to say about AI songwriting. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I looked at this. I, I enjoyed it. I think that it's it's well written, it's clear, but I think that I see this a little different than Latovsky does. And so I'll give you my quick gloss of the issue here and you can respond. Um she is and I don't want to say it's Latovsky, I think she is channeling a lot of the outrage of the uh in, in the photography community. Um and people are upset because essentially it feels like this is a ripoff to them. Like he did something unethical to me. It read as if this is the art world version of plagiarism. Right. And I see it differently than that. Um, can, to, can I stop you just right there or yeah, do you want, absolutely. or is it important for you? But no, it might go ahead, be important for you to go ahead and finish just uh, for some clarification for me. Uh, and by the way, so I don't um, to do justice to Latovsky, uh, the article that the, and just to clear up something, Michael, you were, you were right. Uh, the main um, focus of the essay is on, uh, is it Michael Christopher Brown's? Yeah. Uh, photographs and the controversy in the art world and specifically in the ph- photograph in the world of photography uh, occasioned by his um, his latest work uh, but the uh, and the I was confusing that when I made reference to a, a prestigious art award award winner um, and it was a German artist Boris Eldegesen who won an award using AI and refused it and refused, and refused it. it. And sort of, and this was a sort of test case. I, I think when I uh, give my take on the essay, I'm, I might reference and talk a little bit more about the second example, but mm-hmm. let, let's talk about like you were doing about Brown, but yeah. I wanted, I wanted to ask you a question about your characterization of Brown. And you said you were comparing the interestingly uh, you were comparing the uh, controversy um, in the art, in the photography world, photography world, uh, occasioned by Brown, you were comparing it to the sort of hysteria that folks get over plagiarism in any field. Um, and I wanted to ask you this: Do you think the plagiarism is all the more, um, I guess, scandal worthy, or, or uh, more it produces even more anxiety because it is tied to AFTs because it's tied to marketability because he's profiting from this. Well, that's exactly that's it. part of it. That that's exactly yeah. it. Let me let me start. Yeah, sure. I, I think the easiest way of doing this is sort of just running through some of the 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 content of the article because she says it well and clearly, and I just kind of want to respond to what she says. So sure. She says the negative response provoked by Brown's project encapsulates the industry's sentiment about AI's place in the art world, mistrust, curiosity, and fear. Right. Right. And I think she's dead right because those are 
uh, exact, uh, well, those are exactly the same sentiments that got raised in academia around this, right? What is it? How's it going to be used? Hmm, this is interesting. There's potential here, but my God, this is going to put everybody out of a job. This is very, it's very, and it's very dangerous. Okay. And um, so she says a little further along, the issue with Michael Christopher Brown's 90 miles is not that it is AI generated, but that it lacks imagination. Mm -hmm. And I argue quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. I think that the argument against this is absolutely that it is AI generated. I think that the- And it's not about originality, therefore. Well, you know, I keep coming back to, and uh, I, I don't know the source here, but good artists borrow, great artists steal, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be inspired by something. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is going to be a response to something else. If art, if one of the jobs of art is to imitate the life that, we, that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. AI is a part of this. I think that what- they are saying, or what she's saying here is that, that it, it lacks imagination. Mm -hmm. um, that's an easy angle to take if you mm -hmm. know that it's AI generated. But as mm -hmm. you had referenced earlier, later in the article, um, you know, there was a photographer who won a very prestigious award uh, utilizing a technology that apparently didn't lack imagination then. And he had work he was selling, he was making a profit on this. So, you know, my question is, um, wh where do we draw the lines around what's imaginative and not? If it's selling and if it's doing what art's supposed to do, provoking a response, then to say it lacks imagination, I think is really just uh, you know another way of saying, hey, this is scary as hell and I don't like it because th what this is going to do, quite frankly, is that these technologies are going to break down the barriers between uh, the experts, the artists, and the people who know how to work the technologies to create art or to create a the hyper real art, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the core of this, right? The images uh, imitate the format of photography contests that have been have long rewarding, excuse me, the images imitate the format of photography contests that have long been rewarding photographers making misery look epic. 90 miles is so tethered to photographic language that it is unaware of the loss of meaning that occurs when ideological and aesthetic concepts are transferred from one medium to the other. It capitalizes on the surface resemblance of AI to photography, but misses the crux of what gives documentary photography its power, empathy. AI turns any documentary narrative into a facsimile of storytelling. It is impossible mm -hmm. to feel compassion for simulated characters in Brown in Brown's work. Without empathy, a narrative peddling in misery reads as exploitative. So to me, there are a few contradictions in here. Is it unimaginative and is it a cheap facsimile or is it exploitative? Because quite frankly, I'm not sure you can be successfully exploitative if you haven't touched a nerve in some way. And now the question seems to be, well, is this unoriginal, unoriginative, unoriginal, excuse me, because like what, it's not exploitative enough. It doesn't show the misery of real people. It shows a facsimile of misery. Um, I, I, I struggle here and I don't think, and I think part of the reason I'm struggling here is because I sort of take issue with the argument that what gives documentary photography its power is empathy. For me, a better word there is pathos, that it arouses an emotion, not a particular emotion. Um, I, I think empathy certainly falls under the umbrella of pathos. I don't think that it's wrong, but I think that it's far too limiting. And I think it's limiting in order to make this particular argument. So I, I'm not saying that uh, Latovsky's wrong. I think that she's just taken too thin a slice of the pie here. I think the issue is bigger than empathy mm -hmm. or be, because, you know, the, like I, I wonder if if he doesn't get caught or come clean. Mm -hmm. Do we have this issue? That's what I'm wondering as you're reading the passage. You picked a really interesting passage. And, you know, my sense of it, Michael, what do you think? Um, I think you share uh, my opinion. I, I felt when you were reading it aloud and I was listening to you, 
um, and sort of detaching that moment from the rest of the essay, I felt that she was, I sense, like you do, kind of anxiety on her part, like she's whistling in the dark, because the, the distinction that she wishes to make, you're talking about pathos and ethos, but maybe, maybe, and related to that, I was about to say different from that, but maybe it's related to that. The other distinction that she is insisting on is the classic Baudrillardian distinction between that Baudrillard denies between the real and the unreal. And, um, you know, and viewed from a Baudrillardian perspective, what she's doing is intellectually suspect uh, in that she is sort of insisting that if there is this true awareness, <laughs> if there is this true moment, and, and this was a question I had for you, it seems like the pathos and the ethos, they're weirdly enough, they're not in the viewer of the image. They're only in the photographer, if I'm understanding her passage. And so, um, so I think that's number one. I think that's kind of strange because pathos and, etho and ethos, there has to be some, you know, there has to be a community there with these emotions. Um, it sounds like the only pathos she's really concerned about is the pathos on the part of the photographer. It's as if she's saying, and when you break it down, Michael, I think it gets more and more, unre you know, illogical. Her argument becomes more and more illogical. It's like she's saying, tell me if you think I got this right, if I'm reading her right. It's, it, you know, it's like she's saying that to make this image better, to or make real. sure this image real or credible and effective and artistic, and this is another conflation that's the word, she's that's making. The, it's like real and artistic are conflated. Yes, but, they're but, yeah. yes. So they're synonyms. So that's that's a weird move. And then the other weird move is this idea that, um, okay. Did the photographer feel an emotion when they were capturing this picture or developing this picture? Yes. Uh, yes. Was there some sort of emotion they had at the origin of the creation of the image? Yes. Well, then it's art. No. You mean they just use the image without having this prior originating, legitimating emotion? Bad. I mean, that seems like a strange distinction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, all of this is 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 really. I mean, she goes so. Th there's the first part of the argument. Let, let me let me. She, the second sure. part of her I, argument. I, I wanted to ask you though. You know, am I? Do you think I'm reading the passage right? I, no, I'm I think you're reading it quite correctly, actually. And what I wanted to say is, sure. I think the second part of her argument. Yeah. She tries to. Like so, the first uh, the argument pivots immediately after this, and she says, uh -huh. "There's something to say in Michael Christopher Brown's defense." She's and so do it. However, so for the weekly. next for the next <laughs> little bit, she tries to she tries to find a way okay. to defend what he's done, and um, I think that her defense explains some of the problem with her critique. Okay. So she says, for example, however misguided, he chose to experiment with technology that gives most of us the heebie-jeebies, right? Well, why? So he overcame his fears. Right. So, so good. You're the first one that. out of the cave, right? Right. Uh, right. And um, we are afraid of this. There is an instinctual desire to hang on to recognizable concepts in the unfamiliar terrain of a new medium. You went mm -hmm. and did something different with something that scares everybody. And we don't know what to do with that. And that in and of itself is scary. So I think right there, we've got the crux of the response. Like, wow, this is different and we don't know what it is or how to do with it. And so there's going to be a negative reaction to that. She goes a little bit further on and says, AI is an art form, has a long way to go. Photography's first few decades were spent emulating painting, unable to rec recognize itself as a medium with distinct intent and aesthetic. A little further on down, the paradox of AI is its dependence on existing visuals. No matter the language given, prompts result in an awkward amalgamation of everything that has already been done. So 
I, I think her argument that it lacks imagination mm-hmm. is born out of this statement here that, hey, the only way that you got what you got is by using a series of referential prompts to what's already been done. Mm-hmm. So in that way, your, you know, quote unquote art will always be mm-hmm. something of a retread. Mm-hmm. But it's a retread with a new technology. And uh, we've come to a point where you simply cannot separate uh, technological advancements or techn- technological methodologies from art. The, the idea uh, of, of some sort of pure art, um, you know, devoid of technological influence is a very, very mm-hmm. difficult one to, to, to mount. And so the the argument here seems to be, well, you're, it's always going to be a retread, mm-hmm. right? And I don't know that that you would have to convince me that somehow that retread disqualifies it from being art. The problem that I see here is, hey, you did something that was exploitative in the sense that you made money off of a depiction of other people suffering. And my question is, how is that something that's new? I don't, I don't understand mm-hmm. how, like, I, I, I guess this, I could be naive here and um, you know, I, I certainly don't mean offense, but I don't see how this is uproar or worthy of uproar other than um, it's, it's breaking down some of the, it, it, it's democratizing art. And that's scary because now um, you know, an artist's livelihood is somehow or not somehow very obviously, you know, jeopardized by this. Okay. Do you want to, I, I think I have a couple things to comment on here, Absolutely. but yeah, yeah. I'll, I will take it. I'm going to take it away from uh, what I'm going to say is going to take it away from some of, you know, the, your comments. So I want you to go ahead and finish no, your, I, I think, doing your I, take. I, I think, I think that's it. I think that the, the to finish up, I, I'll just say that the, the, the essay ends mm-hmm. with, uh, Nick Cave, and that's a good place to end, right? Like that—that's not a—that's not a bad thing. Um, but, but what what she says? Uh, well, Nick Cave is at the end. Let's talk about why, as sort of a representative artist who can talk about the importance of originality and imitation in art, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. So, a fan sent Cave a Chat GPT AI song written in the mm-hmm. style of Nick Cave and asked for his thoughts. Cave didn't disappoint. So this is Nick Cave's response, apparently. Mm -hmm. This song is bullshit, a grotesque mockery of what it is to be human. What makes a great song great is not its close (laughs) resemblance to a recognizable work. Writing a good song is not mimicry or replication or pastiche. It is the opposite. It is an act of self-murder that destroys all one has strived to produce in the past. And that's great. And that's certainly very highbrow, but one, I'm not sure that I agree that all art has to be like that. And two, I wonder Mm -hmm. if I haven't seen the song, I don't know anything about this, but Mm -hmm. I really have to wonder if he didn't know that it was AI. I I find it very difficult to believe that his response would be that. I think if someone was to come to him and say, Hey, I wrote this song. You're a huge inspiration. And it sounds like you. And it sounds like. And I just, song. I was, I was trying. They, they might. He, it, I think the, the, the most caustic he would probably be as a response would be like, "Man, be you. Don't, don't mm-hmm. be me. Be you." And that's not. He that's wouldn't not say this. it's a travesty of humankind. A grotesque he, mockery what it, of what it is to be human. <laughs> I mean, look. I think if you're gonna, if so you're, you're gonna go, go big. But <laughs> I think that again, what Cave is responding to is not the product, it's the technology. So that gets me to my final bit, and I'll leave it here. You know, she says, that she titles the essay, um, the problem of AI photography is not the medium, it's the message. Well, Uh I think the problem of AI photography is that the medium is the message. AI is somehow somehow conflated with inauthentic. I think that we've failed to realize that a a part and parcel of AI is the hyperreal. And that this notion of real versus unreal or authentic versus illegitimate is a useless discussion when we're having this discussion. Mm-hmm. And so the problem is that it, it, it's not the medium, it's the message. It, it's it's cute. And as a McLuhan fan, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan, 
but I'm going to double down and say the medium is the message. And the response is that somehow AI equals cheating um, just as it is in a composition classroom or that AI equals fake because it doesn't have, you know, a human author's signature on it. But man, I don't know if we look around, that seems a thin argument to me. So, uh, so you're, you're really coming out as a Baudrillardian in this because I'm hearing two things here. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you because I'm going to take this in a Run slightly different direction. Well, well, but but I want to engage. Um, I want to engage a couple things that you you just mentioned. The first one, uh, I think you came out very strongly as a Baudrillardian on this because what you're finding, you're finding traces of fear. In particular, a kind of intrinsic fear that we have, that experts have rather, that experts have. Mm -hmm. Their expertise is questioned, whether it's an artistic expert or a writing teacher expert or all. No, I'm wrong. It's not that their expertise is questioned. It's that the value of their expertise is well, challenged. It, it's well, yeah, the, well, that you're right. It's not questioning. It's like the fucking, I'm sorry. I can, oh. I can't, I can do that on you. I can do that on Spotify. It's, hey, it's but, you know, it's late, it's but, late. but not on YouTube. Um, but that they're basically it's blowing it up. It's uh-huh. blowing up all the, it's blowing up the possibility of making an expert claim. You're right. It's not mm-hmm. just questioning it. It's blowing it up. Now, if I understand you, what you're, what you're saying is that these, there are moments of tension in Latovsky's essay that are interesting because we see it replicated in a lot of discussion of chat GPT and AI, where experts in various fields fear the technology or are anxious, made anxious by the technology because there's something about this technology that is democratizing that empowers or enables uh, a parody version of the skill, you know, a simulacra of the skill. Uh, I mean, really, Baudrillard is really fitting all this very well because, you know, what's the chat GPT authored paper? It's a simulacra of a good paper. Is it not a good paper then? Well, I don't know. It could be, but it's a simulacra that we know. And that Similar quality is what challenges the professionals claim to be a professional Mm -hmm. and their claims to be at the head of the classroom. And it challenges professionals in any particular field. So just to before before you say anything, just I'm I'm trying to summarize your argument uh, um, and I'll I'll try and do that quickly. But I'm sensing that your your criticism of Latovsky has to do with your Baudrillardianism that you're sensing there is an insistence, a kind of emotional appeal to the real, as opposed to the simulacra, that Latovsky is making, that we see other experts make. And at heart, it's a kind of fear of technology's potential to democratize things. Mm-hmm. I think that's fair. Yeah. You had a comment you were going to make there before I said anything else? Or no, I, I was just going to say that, that um, you know, the real as opposed yes, to the simu- as, as opposed to the hyper real is mm-hmm. safe and i think that this is you know a lot of this is rooted in the uncertainty and the fear of you know sure. what we don't know and again it's it's also sure. your your expertise is being i think the perception is that your expertise is being devalued and that's mm-hmm. always going to promote or provoke a huge response indeed you know indeed. so that yeah Indeed. Okay. So I think. So, you, so where do you want to go? Where what, What's your take on? Well, this? Uh, so first off, I think that's a really strong argument. And if you, if our listeners heard the last episode, um, I'm going to make an incredible admission. Uh, Michael uh, is, has persuaded me with this argument. I saw the return of Baudrillard and I was not ashamed. I was not afraid. I found myself <laughs> uh, compelled and persuaded by this argument that, um, you know, Latovsky is a little bit, uh, th- there might be a weakness in the parts of the, her argument where, um, she's insufficiently Baudrillardian, but okay. Now here's where I want to take the argument, which is not too far from, I think we were where we were. Um, and I'm going to, but I'm going to start by, uh, start this discussion by, um, 
by returning to something you said and pushing and recapitulating it, but also pushing back. So here, here's what I would do. Okay, now that we got all this clear, um, I wanted to return to what you said about art and creativity. Okay. And this idea, and in fact, I think this was your statement that um, Latovsky, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I jotted it down. Something like Latovsky is wrong to think that a retread, I think you used the word retread, um, a retread, an artistic retread is in a new medium does not constitute a new development in art, mm-hmm. that a new development in a new medium, even if it's retreading older images or trucking in the previous medium, it's still genuinely new simply because it's being used on the new medium. Is that is that kind of where you were arguing? Maybe I misunderstood that argument. I, I'm arguing that just because something isn't brand yes. new yes. that doesn't necessarily disqualify it from being as art and that the use of a new medium is pushing boundaries and rather than saying that it's unimaginative or it's inauthentic i think the ah. argument can be made that now again i'm not going to say that this is across the board everything that gets spit out is necessarily artistic i think that you know if we could somehow come up with a universal definition of art, this becomes a much easier conversation to have. I will say that you, the, the, the work in, in question here is a really good mimicry of photography. It looks like a picture. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. produces a response. It has a message. It has all of the, the requisite components for what I understand to be necessary in a work of art. The big rub seems to be that it's inauthentic because he used artificial intelligence to generate it. And that to me is, is akin to saying, well, you asked for advice from a friend that I don't like, or I don't value. So that's not valid. And I, I don't, I don't, I can't go there. Well, Michael, I'm very glad I asked you for the clarification because I did mishear you. And so uh, what you were saying, uh, you you are making the claim that it's, so now I understand you to be making the claim that any work within the new medium constitutes a further development of art. Again, I'm wary of these all, I would say work in a new medium can certainly constitute Okay, okay. Yes. But I think it's a different well, I, I don't know if I'm gonna allow you to have that out. Because I mean, okay, so some work is not emit some work is not necessarily okay. So here's the thing. Scrap- there's a joke, there's a joke that was circulating <laughs> on the internet that I found very, very funny when I was in graduate school. And it was one of these um little stupid posts and it was talking about your kid drew this fire truck it yeah. looks like it needs to be shaved f it's not art right like right. oh this is a horrible picture f it's not art if you look through some of the ai art galleries there's stuff on there that i was like okay it's 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 whatever it's a, it's a picture of mm-hmm. a fire hydrant that's fine it doesn't do anything for me um I, i'm not an expert that can say this is art that's not art Um, Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where I fail in this argument. So I don't want to say everything, but I I do want to say that I have a very hard time accepting that because artificial intelligence is is utilized, that that disqualifies it from being art. Okay, I'm sorry. I had a stammering formulation of of my question. I think my question for you is this. Uh, I think this is a better version of my question, I hope. Um, So when they are... AI art is good mm-hmm. in those cases where it's good. Mm-hmm. And it's not, and, and I agree with you. It's not a matter of it being all good or all bad. Mm-hmm. And what and what you're mainly taking um, um what you're mainly taking issue with Tosky is this idea that there's no possibility for new art within the new medium 
new endeavors within the new medium of ever being art because of the lack of empathy or things like that. So I got yes. you. So yes. now I'm just asking, oh, so, okay, I think we got it there. Um, so I guess my, it, I don't know if I have a question for you, but I just want to, uh, a question, I have a question for both of us. I want us to linger for a moment and tell me, uh, and, and let's th- see if we can think about what makes, what would make the good new art good? Well, what's so, making it good? Okay. Okay. So, not all of it's good, but no. you say there has to be the possibility that some of it's good. Like, so now, so, why, what made it good? Okay. So you're asking, good? like, is there some sort of threshold that we could pass that would say this is. I'm not even asking for a threshold. I'm asking, I'm just wanting a characteristic. Okay. Like, so I think that a maybe, criteria, the criteria. So I, and I, I think we're going to disagree here. I have a feeling we're going to disagree. How do you know that? You don't know that. This is just a thought experiment. It, it I don't is. know. So my, <laughs> well, I know what I think. I know what I'm going to say. Um, I think that the problem that we could legitimately hang on AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that as it stands now, mostly um, it is referential, right? Like you are only going to be able to get it to... I mean, what, what's her statement here? The paradox of AI is in its dependence on existing visuals. Mm-hmm. No matter the language given, prompts result in an awkward amalgamation of everything that has mm-hmm. already been done. Mm-hmm. So the problem is if you say, look, I want a picture of a dog, it's right. going to go scour the get, internet. It scours the internet and finds dogs. Of dogs. Finds so dog pictures. It will always be a replication or a modification of something that already exists. And so... I guess for me, I would say when AI reaches a point where it is able to create something new, then we will. How can that happen? How will we know that? How we? I I think I'm answering a. I think I'm answering a question that I'm asking a question that cannot be answered by anybody. No, but that's the rub. That's exactly the rub. How will we know? And so this is the funny th- this is the funny moment here. It's okay. the same thing as saying, well, is this a good is this is this AI generated paper legitimate or not? Right? Mm-hmm. If you don't catch the plagiarism, then that's going to seem awfully legitimate to you. Mm-hmm. Right? But if you recognize this via, you know, however many different tells as artificially generated, or generated by artificial intelligence, then that's suddenly a bad paper. So is the AI song written for Nick Cave a bad song? It is if he recognizes it, it recognizes it as the product of artificial intelligence. If and you're, the Michael, images are if the images are recognized as being artificially generated by artificial intelligence, they are bad, right? But right, if we exactly. don't know that, yeah, then they're new. But Michael, you totally convinced me that that Nick Cave and Latovsky are now you've you, you're arguing your other point, which you already convinced me. I'm not a, I'm not arguing with you on that. I think you you like I said, you made a Baudrillardian and um, that I think you're right to say that Nick Cave is working on his intuition uh, in sort of a residual notion of originality in order to push back against his perception of the new technology. Now you totally convinced me of that. You don't right, need so to fight that argument. How, how but do we my know? question is, my question is, what would constitute new work? And, and and is that your answer? Your answer is we'll never be able to tell. That is well, a think, weird that is a well, weird crisis if that's the answer. That's a weird that's a weird new situation that we haven't quite had before if that if that's the answer. But I, I don't know I, that was your answer. I, I think what well maybe I'll say it a different way. Maybe when it seems new or it feels new when it looks new you know um i'm not I, trying to be a jerk but no I, but but i'm but i'm holding on to I, I i don't think that answers my question because what i what i've been asked what i'm asking is how can you tell you can't I just want to know how i can tell so well, when you say well when that something is new and then something will follow i'm not even asking about that i'm asking so maybe i okay i think i understand the question and Maybe either A, 
it would have to be such a profoundly radical break. In other words, maybe mm. we have something mm. produced that could only be produced via technology. And I don't Which know what, what that happens would look like. with photography. And we don't know what that would look like. That's what Bazan says happens in photography, mm -hmm. right? Let's return. And maybe this is a way of, I, it's not going to be an answer to the question. I, I wonder if my question really could be answered, but I think it's a pertinent question. Michael, I, I like the fact that you brought up that, uh, that you read this particular passage from Litovsky, where she talks, where she makes the comparison between photography and uh, painting. Because that allows us, I think, maybe to make two critical media studies podcast uh, kind of points uh, in reference to previous episodes. Um, and I think it's worth doing before we, we return to this question of what constitutes novelty, what might constitute novelty um, in AI art. So uh, I'll just read briefly the quote again. Photography's first few decades were spent emulating painting unable to recognize itself as a medium with distinct intent and aesthetic. Combined with the fact that AI engines are trained on the history of art, I suspect that the immediate future of AI will be similar, regurgitating the last hundred years of photography, illustration, and latent desires. Now, as McLuhan, my first comment. Now, as a McLuhan stand, I have to say that even though Litovsky, uh, and, you know, she wins my heart, by referencing McLuhan in her title. But the statement, um, as we've discussed, the statement that she makes is actually antithetical to McLuhan's own history of the arts and media, which number one, um, um, McLuhan's advantages, as we've talked about on this podcast before, and you were referencing it earlier, this idea that we, we can't make a, a simple separation, as you were saying earlier, um, between art and media, number one, but also number two, more specifically, McLuhan is, um, uh, McLuhan talks about the way, in fact, this is one of the grand maxims that maybe is worth challenging, but he says it happens over and over again in media, in the development of media technologies, um, explicitly in their relation to art. And it's this, he says that, you know, so that, for example, what print culture McLuhan argues, and he says, you can see this all the way into the relation between television, between movies that are aired on television and move and cinema and earlier classic cinema, that the first thing, the first necessary uh, subject, the first necessary content of art, of the new media technology rather, is the old art. So that the previous art, the previous art is always the content of the new media. So she is talking about, well, it took a while for photography to become painting. Or rather, it took a while for photography to become photography and a distinct art form from painting. Well, McLuhan insists, M McLuhan is insistent, but that's always the case. That's not an, that's not an exceptional case. That's this typical way. Now, moving also to Bazan, who we just discussed. Uh, and this, this I think, is where we get closer to the question we were both wrestling in. Uh, Bazan also makes a McLuhan-esque point without realizing it's a McLuhan-esque point, because um, I don't think either writer was aware of each other. Uh, Bazan says precisely what um, Latovsky says about photography is that photography did indeed copy its old models. From a McLuhan-esque perspective, this is not surprising. But, but he said, but he also argues, that at a certain point, the invention of photography not only freed painting to do new things, but there was a moment he characterizes or he talks about surrealist photography as kind of one of the er examples of this, one of the primary examples of this, where photography realized that it could explore its own uh, uh, idiom, reject imitation, and become an art form on its own terms. So maybe using Bazan, now I'm going to sort of circle back to our question. Um, 
And maybe I'm going to try to do a tentative answer to the question, and you'll tell me what you think. So the tentative, using Bazan to answer Lutovsky's question. Um, is it reasonable to expect that out of the imitations that AI will generate, there will someday be the equivalent of the dark star, of the black star, of the what is it word, the the singularity. Mm -hmm. I mean, will will the moment when AI art becomes art is that akin to the singularity, when all of a sudden the imitations find itself? Can the medium, can the technology create that moment itself? Um, Obviously, for Bazan, the surrealist photographers, there was a kind of there are these pioneering photographers, not just the surrealists, but any any photographer that was using their medium and exploring their medium um, and not so concerned and uh, without um, a direct concern with representing reality. And at, at that point, photography becomes its art form. Um, for AI to to create new art, would we not have to imagine something like a singularity occurring? Well, so I'm I don't know if this is a cop out of an answer or if I'm taking it head on. Um I let's, think that let's it, hear it. I think it depends. And so I'm gonna sort of sift through some of what you said and take a look at one last line of hers, which I think explains things here. So if we say, and we're going to just, you know, traipse, traipse through the daisies of all our dear friends, right? McLuhan says essentially that the old is the content of the new, right? That right. whatever's new is just showing us the old, okay? Right, right And right. that overlap between the old and the new is really the problem here. It's at that moment that we have our problem. And I think you can split into two schools, Right. You can look at McLuhan and say, I think he's got it right, that the old is the content of the new. And then you can use Baudrillard's perception of the hyper, you know, idea of the hyper real. And this fits into a somewhat uncomfortable, but explainable little spot, right? She says, Nick Cave hit the exasperated nail on the head. And this is the, the, the important sentence here. AI as an art form can move forward when we stop imitating and use the technology on its own merits with ideas and concepts unique to the medium. So it's ironic that she's used McLuhan in the title because what she's saying here is that we can't really consider AI as an art form and we can't go forward with that idea. Until, until we're, you, we're able to use the technology, right? Until the new is the content of the new. Yeah. And I think that what she wants and maybe what the photography community wants or would mm -hmm. feel better with is a total break from the old and the new. In other words, leave photography alone. Mm -hmm. Go do something else. AI would be great if it couldn't so closely mimic photography mm -hmm. because what that would do and what we're hanging our definition of art upon here is to leave expertise intact. Right, 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 right. 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 Brilliant point. Brilliant and point. and I, so I think, I think that's, and that, that's why I, that this, this, I've come right back to the full circle to my starting point here, where I think a lot of this is rooted in fear and, mm -hmm. and understandably, I mean, there's, 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 you know, very, very real economic implications to th the idea behind real art. And, and there's a real reason to demonize uh, AI generated photography as not being authentic photography. But I think that if we're going to look at this through an artistic lens and say, well, what constitutes art? If you're going to take McLuhan as, as your guy, then we're going to say, man, this is art. I I hear you. I think that that's a great point. And let's take that as a. Um, I have a closing anecdote that I'd like to add to this. Mm -hmm. But let's take what you just said as a. Uh, as an answer to the question I was I was previously trying to answer, and, and we were previously trying to 
reflect on. I want to uh, add, make an immediate comment, though, on what you just said, Michael, because, you know, as you were talking, um, I think it's really helpful to re repeat myself on McLuhan, but I think the way in which he both conflates art and media and also allows us to, Bazan does it as well in a different form or in a, in a, in a, in a particularized way. I think it's really helpful the way that McLuhan encourages us to get beyond the novelty of technology and think of technology within a historical sequence uh, of technology as always changing perception and therefore changing uh, aesthetic standards and modes of arts and always sort of rearranging things. And so that there is always a kind of history of disruption and, con and also consolidation. That said, I wonder if McLuhan has met his match. I do oh, so. wonder if, um, I do wonder, about, I mean, I, I'm not a person who uses the language of the singularity often. In fact, I usually try to avoid those people with mm -hmm. like a plague. <laughs> but, um, but, I'm using that word a lot here, and I think it might be appropriate because one of the things that I'm getting, you know, from our discussion is this. Um, for the first time, I mean, what you just said, Latovsky is looking for us or humans to recognize, to impose maybe a break, mm -hmm. uh, or she's speaking for the human wish to impose a clear demarcating line between the new media and older artistic practice. And all of this is predicated on the human. But the whole point of chat GPT, uh, of AI, is that there's human input, but that there is this completion of the circuit, literally, that's coming with the technology. And there's always the possibility that the technology might surprise us in its regurgitation and constant recirculation of the facts and the scouring of big data. So, in other words, we we have the singularity, i.e., an unexpected event mm -hmm. that is happening outside of human human control. I think I think Nick Cave and Latovsky and Barry Fall most of the time we're working within these human parameters. And I think we're finally talking about something that television couldn't do, photography couldn't do, uh, uh, print, printing presses couldn't do. But we are talking about something, a, a, some, a self-generating mechanism that is extra human or non-human. Mm -hmm. So we may have a rupture here. And I don't know what to say about that, except... I have my closing anecdote. Do you have a comment? And then I'll give my closing anecdote. No, I, I, I think I've, I've already sort of uh, given mine, to be honest with you. My, my, well, my takeaway. My closing anecdote has to do with favorite band of mine, Oasis. And my ambivalent reaction to a recent AI generated controversy involving the band Oasis. And uh -huh. I'm going to refer to my notes for some of this, but it, it Kind of is an example of the singularity that I was just speaking of. So I'll, I'll stop with this uh, and just mention this episode. Can I find my notes here? Yes, I can. So, Michael, here's the story. There's a band called Breezer. And they recently did uh, a, a, it's called A-Isis. A-Isis. Colon, the Lost Tapes. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and here was, uh, so Breezer, I don't know much about them. I only heard one song from this and I should say, I went back and found out more information about Breezer. My only experience with this particular song, I don't, I didn't write down the, the name of the song, but, um, and there may have been multiple songs actually, but they were given, but the, the, here's the band. Uh, and here were the band's instructions that they gave to AI. So the band, um, I, I guess they often do original material. And this indeed was an original song. But 
not too dissimilar from the similar to the Nick Cave example that you were giving. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the uh, this was the imperative. So they wrote a song and they just used AI. And this is often how AI is used in music technologies, at least. I don't know if, it, if there is a direct analogy with photography, but here is what it was. So they did the backing track, right? The right. singers, the singer sang, they wrote the song. They performed the song, but here was the issue. The singer didn't quite sound enough like Liam Gallagher. Okay. So that's where they brought in the AI. They said, make this, make our, make my voice sound more like Liam Gallagher's voice. Now that is something as we have seen from other AI generated musical controversies that AI can do like nobody's business. If so, I want to imitate the Michael Rapici voice or the Barry Falk voice, and I know there are countless millions that are writing on the uh, on the duplication of our voices. Absolutely. But, it, but it, if I use AI, that, in fact, that has been one of the cases of propaganda so let me, and lying, let me ask right? you Let me ask you yeah. a question about this. Yeah. yeah. How is that different than having an engineer behind the soundboard? Who is it's not. It's not, no. it's not, yeah, it's not, no, I, I go ahead and answer your question, but I mean, that's it. I'm done. How, yeah, how is yeah. that different? Cause that's, what's done now. And we it's don't not different. bat an eye. It's not different. And let me continue this. I'll continue the story and we'll see okay. how this is much closer to the singularity than I personally would wish for. Okay. So here were the instructions and you're right to say these instructions are exactly what you do in the production process for that's music. Right. That's right. right. It's it's the job of the engineer. It's the job of the recording engineer. It's the job of the producer. Make me sound big. Make these drums sound big. Right. And so um, so the here are the instructions to AI. And it's something that the technology is already incredibly good at. Um, said, make my voice sound like Liam. OK, so I didn't know any of this history. I still don't know that much about that history to be on, on truth to be told. But. I think it's important to say that I heard this cold. Uh, I did know it was an AI generated song and that the song was generated by these instructions and that Liam and Noel did not write, not rather Noel did not write the song and that Liam, although many people were confused and thought that Liam was singing, Liam is not singing. So I knew that it was a fake quote unquote, a simulacra, quote unquote. But then they played it on the radio, the radio program I was listening to. Uh, do you want to ask my reaction to it? I would love to. What was uh, your, thank you what for was asking. your reaction. Thank you for so I knew it was a fake. Unlike Latovsky, I knew it was a fake. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know the details. I didn't know anything about how it was generated. I read in an interview how it was generated. Um uh, but I was listening to it and they played about 20 seconds of it, the song. And by the end of the 20 seconds, I think my resistance to the song wore away after two seconds. Mm -hmm. By the end of the song, I'm thinking, this is the best effing Oasis song I've ever heard. And see that that's important. What does that mean? That's what important does because that that's, mean? that's the question, right? Like it's easy if the song sucks. You could. This is not art. This is obviously not the right thing. But, um, you know, if it's good, but but now we're weird. now we're left. Now we're left. See, here's the thing. If it's good, now we're left writing it off as pop music. Well, that's not serious art. That's pop music. It couldn't generate serious art. Well, okay, but you could. know what. I'm not going to go to the high culture. I'm not going to go to the high culture thing, but, but still I will say while my reaction, I think was genuine, quote unquote, mm -hmm. Baudrillard, whatever Baudrillard would say, it was genuine enough. But I do think that this raises a lot of interesting questions that puts us in postmodern Disneyland. So two quick questions. That was well done. Questions prompted. Thank you. Nice uh, two <laughs> Two quick questions, uh, uh, many questions that are prompted by this. Number one, um, what am I liking when I say it's a good song? Well, what I'm really saying 
is this sounds like Oasis songs that I've heard previously. But that's a kind of criteria for liking pop music. It, well, that's the point. Not only that, <laughs> right? it's also it's kind of this criteria. also is a direct challenge to the well, it's inauthentic or it's not original. I mean, it, it's um, y- this is a fantastic example. It struck me as both, and this is this is even sanctioned by T.S. Eliot in the individual tradition and individual talent. It's not wholly new. It struck me, you know, why did I like it? It was an imitation, but it was somehow different. It was a combination of the old and the new. So there was that. But here's the other thing. And this is the place where my brain computer starts, you know, giving up sparks and, you know, putting out smoke. Oasis themselves on a good day, they're an imitation of the Beatles. So what does it mean that I'm liking an AI generated imitation of a band that did uh, analog <laughs> imitations of Beatle recordings with a singer that always sounded like, to me, a cross between John Lennon and John Lydon. So I was always liking Liam for sounding like John Lydon and John Lennon. Mm-hmm. The Reese's Peanut Butter Cups of uh, British pop singers. Anyway, a lot of contradictions. Here. <laughs> a lot of contradictions. I, I think we have to stop there, very because I, it I will not get better before. than that. Um, I, I, you know, it's these are. I, I think I'm going to go back and just say that I agree with you. I don't think we have a concrete answer to this. Um, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly don't. But I'm a fan of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. And I think, quite frankly, if you ever decided to start an AI band, you've already named it. <laughs> so um, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup explosion or experience. The experience. experience. Yeah. All right. Well, Barry, um, as always, thank you. This was this was a lot of fun. This one was this was enjoyable. <laughs> I hope listeners agree. Uh, like us, share us, support us, duplicate us exploit us you're welcome Something. to copy this and play it for your friends it's fine <laughs> generate us multi-generate us uh thanks again michael all right Barry. have a good evening i'll talk to you, you again soon you too all right thanks for listening to the critical media studies podcast to find out more about the show check out our webpage at critical